It is time to bring in Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. Arthur joins us on a Monday morning, and what do we talk about? We talk about food and drink, grog. Good morning, Arthur. Grog? Grog. God, I haven't heard that word <laughs> in so long. I, I made grog once. I know. Most people don't even know what grog is anymore. Well, let's not, let's not even go there. No, we won't. Because where I want to go is to its relative, okay. nog. I do think the words are rel- related. Na eggnog. Well, let, let me start with Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> it is a Happy New Year, Healthy New Year. When you get to my age, that's sort of healthy and then happy. If you're healthy, then you're happy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, eggnog, I guess, is a Christmas thing. But as I do not celebrate Christmas, or unless I get invited to a Christmas party, Happy to go to that then. Um, I, uh, I I somehow associate eggnog with New Year. No, it's, and, the, it, and these it, it, days yeah. you can go to your supermarket and buy a container of uh, what I usually consider perfectly acceptable eggnog. Actually, but no alcohol. So you have to add your alcohol of choice. My choice is rum, although I do understand that a lot of people prefer bourbon in their eggnog. And uh, discussing this with my nephew yesterday, uh, who uh, is an amateur mixologist, he said, oh, I asked him, do you, do you ever make this recipe for, uh, for a spoonable eggnog that we made all through your childhood? And he said, well, I don't make that one very often, although I have the recipe. Um, but the one I make is from one of my many bar books. And it's uh, made with añejo tequila and amontillado sherry eggnog. What? A- 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 añejo is is aged tequila. Uh, I had not, you know I know that his wife Michelle loves tequila, and I know that there's some you know tequila uh, has an effect on some people. I guess that's very particular to that booze. I find rum. Um, has a particular effect on me, which is that I fall asleep. Uh, you give me a rum and coke, and I'm taking a nap. But um, I do want to try this. I have not tried this, but I, I, un- I, I do not question my nephew because everything he's come, he's made this for parties. Uh, they give parties, um, and this is a party amount. So I'm going to give this recipe. Uh, it's. I'm not, you know what, he didn't tell me which book it was from. Um, but it's a dozen eggs. So in, in the end, it makes like a gallon of eggnog. You have to have a big crowd, I think, for this, because it's got a lot of alcohol in it. Um, so in, in a blender, he says, although my blender would not hold all this, um, but he has the, one of those you know fancy blenders, I forget what you call them, and they do have very large... Uh, mixer jars, Vitamix. Um, so, Vitamix. Pardon me. Vitamix. Yeah, mm. uh, maybe you know that's a brand, but it's like that. Yeah. You know, it's a super blender. I keep thinking maybe I should get one of these, but then again, I, I, I don't know. In a blend, you know, I have my. I, I've talked about this a zillion times. I still have the same blender that was given to me when I got my first apartment as a sophomore in college, um, and it was old then. In a blender. Um, you're going to take your dozen eggs. I, you know, I would do this in a stand-up mixer. In a stand because you're going to make a gallon. In a stand-up mixer, beat your dozen eggs until they are well mixed, you know, like nice and smooth, says this recipe. And then add what I consider a, oh, and by, uh, by the way, um, what I consider an, an inordinate amount of nutmeg, but Brian's big on nutmeg, I've noticed. Um, you want three teaspoons of freshly grated nutmeg and 18 ounces by volume. Uh, by volume, that's a cup and a half. I don't know why they said, uh, is that a cup and a half? No. 18 ounces by volume is over two cups. I would say two cups is plenty, 16 ounces by volume, of uh, super fine sugar. That's the fun, fun, I, that's what they used to call it. I don't know what they call it now. It comes. It's a ripoff product. I gotta say, 
It comes in these little, maybe they're one pound, like decanters, and you cannot, I have not seen it in, in five pound bags, which is what I want. But what I learned many years ago um, from my baking mentor, uh, Carol Walter, was to take your plain old uh, granulated sugar, and before you put it in its storage canister, when you can bring it home from the market, run it through the food processor until it's super fine. It's the same thing and vastly cheaper. They do call, sometimes it's called baker's ch- sugar. Sometimes it's called bar sugar, B-A-R, as at the bar. And, and in fact, this is, would be the case where it would, in fact, be bar sugar. So uh, you want, I would say, two cups of bar sugar is enough for 12 eggs, three teaspoons of grated nutmeg, and here it comes, 12 ounces of aged tequila, Añejo tequila, and 15 ounces of Amontillado sherry. Amontillado sherry is a semi-sweet sherry. Let's call it that. And then to that, you're going to add, wait, we're not finished. We forgot the dairy product. (laughs) Nog always has a dairy product. In this case, uh, two quarts of milk and 24 ounces of heavy cream. Got it. Wow. This is this is this will uh, uh, definitely make a jolly party. Now back to the spoonable eggnog, which I did make yesterday because I hadn't made it in years, and um, I treated myself to a small portion. I made a half of the usual recipe, which is just two eggs beaten, and I did this all by hand. Well, no, no not quite. I used a hand electric mixer at some point, but the egg yolks. I beat by hand uh, with a whisk with uh, um, two tablespoons of sugar, one tablespoon per egg. Beat beat, beat it until it's nice and fluffy and yellow, and then you can add your half a cup, well, no, in this case, two ounces, a quarter of a cup of rum, a quarter of a cup of rum. In another bowl, you're going to beat until relatively stiff, uh, 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 one cup of heavy cream, and in the other bowl, you're going to beat the egg whites from the two egg yolks um, until they're stiff. And then you just fold in the the cream into the egg yolk and rum mixture, and then you fold the egg whites in at the end, and you will have a fluff. Truthfully, after all these years, I, uh, yesterday, it was too rich for me. It was not something I could eat for its own sake. Fortunately, I had just bought a big tray of blueberries, and it was a wonderful thing to top a few spoonfuls, of, you know, a couple big spoonfuls on top of a bowl of berries. Um, these nice blueberries made me feel a little bit more sane than just eating it out of the cup, the spoonable eggnog. But we did used to love this stuff. And I, I, I'm also thinking that this might be a very good thing to freeze, that it might make a good semifredo. I haven't tried that yet. Semifredo, which actually means half cold, is actually a homemade ice cream. And the base of an Italian semifredo is usually something like the base for eggnog, although it's cooked. Uh, Most of the time, it's a cooked base. It's not just the beaten yolks, but you, you, you make a custard with sugar and uh, either cream or milk or a combination and, uh, and eggs. And, you know, you cook that until it's about 160 degrees. I never take the temperature of anything, but everything's dead at 160 degrees, plus it won't curdle at 160 degrees. So that, that's what I would do if I wanted a cooked base. Uh, let's give you some proportions. Um, for let's say for for you know, let, you know what you can use the same proportions that you use for uh, the spoonable eggnog, but take your eggs, beat them well with sugar, uh, beat in the, the the milk and cream. Uh, and, well, you can split in this case. You can split the the milk and cream and make it uh, for four eggs. Uh, uh, one cup of milk and one cup of cream, and cook it over 
relatively low heat until it thickens, as they old recipes always say, until it coats a spoon. Um, and that is a good measure if it coats the spoon. It will firm up even a little bit more as it cools down. And then you can uh, uh, fold in the egg whites and put that into a loaf pan that you have lined with a plastic wrap. And did I say the alcohol? You have to add your alcohol here. And uh, I, I would use, you know, half a cup of rum for using one cup each of cream and milk. But uh, you could use more, not don't too much more, because, of course, alcohol is an uh, antifreeze and your, your, your semi-fredo won't freeze. So that's enough. Uh, uh, I like the taste. If you want more alcohol flavor, you can always this is just put a spoon of the said alcohol on top of each serving of frozen uh, semifredo. So that's it. And then you put that in the freezer, and you'll have a, a cake of ice cream, of homemade ice cream. It's really and with cookies. I serve that. I would serve that with some kind of plain biscuit or whatever, something plain, just just a, a crisp foil, you might say. Now, so now we dealt with the eggnog. Um, <laughs> you know, what are we going to have? I don't know. You know, I'm an anti New Year's Eve person. So am I. I have been for many, many years. I rarely make it to midnight. Um, and if I do, it's in front of the television. So I haven't been to a New Year's party in 30 years, I'm sure. Uh, maybe more. No, maybe, yeah, maybe more. And, but I do like New Year's Day parties very much. I think New Year's Day is way more festive than New Year's Eve for various reasons. And I, maybe chief among them for me was we always went to my paternal grandparents uh, for New Year's Day and my grandfather always made something special. And I say my grandfather because he was the chief cook, but not bottle washer, in my grandparents' house, although my grandmother, Rose, did cook. And, uh, you know, I make scrambled... This is something nice. I make scrambled eggs exactly the way I learned from my grandma, Rose, who, by the way, at the end of her life when I was an adult... I called her Rosie just to annoy her. She's not supposed to call your grandmother Rosie. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I make scrambled eggs exactly the way my grandmother did. Uh, I taught my nephew to make scrambled eggs the way my grandmother did. I don't think his mother does. And uh, 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 visiting in Philadelphia recently, uh, I learned that uh, uh, Sydney, his six-year-old, now six-year-old, um, said, oh, let's have scrambled eggs for breakfast. I said, great. She said, I'll make the eggs. I said, you really? And she makes scrambled eggs exactly the way my grandmother Rose made scrambled eggs. So hey, something about there's, eggs. there's a, a, a legacy for you. My father used to, uh, when he wasn't working in clubs and stuff, and in the summertime when he would take time off, he would let us stay up with him overnight, and we'd play casino card games and stuff like that. It used to drive my mother and grandmother crazy. But then... At uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, after the sun came up, he'd go in the kitchen and make scrambled eggs and onions. Oh, my god! Oh, I love that. Oh. There was no, there's still to this day, there's still nothing better than scrambled eggs and onions. Oh, yeah, I agree. You know, I, and, uh, of course, if you add lox or smoked salmon, I, I prefer lox, salty lox, actually. Um, it's lox eggs and onions, which on menus, at the, uh, I don't know if there's a menu around that still calls it... Uh, uh, L E O Leo a Leo yeah well, that's it Leo. anyway yeah lo I love that myself and in fact I also love which I only which I made only a few days ago uh, was is is uh, chopped hard cooked eggs with onions uh, with and I make I make golden sautéed chopped onions and just mix it in with Whatever fat the onions cooked in is enough fat to add to this. Um, and that's it. That's it. In fact, I had. I'm gonna. I'm gonna confess. I had this tiny bit of chicken fat, soup fat, in the <laughs> fridge. So I cooked the onions in my chicken fat and then mixed it with hard cooked eggs. But that's not what we're eating on New Year's Day this year. We are eating what we always eat on New Year's Day, 
which is lentils, in one form or another. My preferred form is to cook the lentils with an Italian sausage called cotechino. Um, and cotechino, the cotta, refers to skin. It is a sausage made with ground pig skin, which is very, very gelatinous. And when you cook this sausage, you end up with a broth that is very gelatinous, which is a good thing. And you take the broth and cook lentils in it, which symbolize money. So it's one of those foods that many cultures have taken on as a symbolic food, just to show you how ubiquitous lentils are, one, around the world, and two, all different kinds of lentils, and, and, and two, how all minds think alike, <laughs> essentially. Um, and I always point this out. This is a, um, a psychoanalytical, I guess you would have to say, a concept uh, that all minds think alike. And I always point this out when people tell me, as somebody did the other day, a Chinese person, that pasta came from China. And I said, I'm sorry. But pasta did not come from China. China had pasta for eons, uh, but other places in the world made pasta besides China. They didn't have to learn how to make it from China because you just, you know, uh, we, we uh, human minds learn very similar things at the same time, but not from each other necessarily. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So lentils are one of those things that in in, in a number of cultures, they symbolize money, and you can see why. Even though, by the way, the word lentil comes from the uh, the same root as lens, as something you see through a lens, and you can see why they would be called lenses. Um, So this year, I have no cotechino. And also, you need to have a crowd for a cotechino. Uh, one slice is about as all you can eat, and I have never seen a cotechino uh, shorter than a, a foot, 10 inches maybe. And and it's very big in diameter, too. A cotechino is a substantial thing. And you can buy them uh, here in New York. I, I know where to buy them. My butcher will actually order them for you. Maybe uh, there's a butcher in, in um, Bay Ridge uh, who probably carried them all through the season. And if I went there, he's closed on Tuesday. Well, it'd be closed tomorrow, Tuesdays. But if he, they're open today. So, you know, maybe I'll call. Maybe they have a small one. Maybe I can find somebody else to eat it. <laughs> it's a hard thing to find somebody else to eat, i got to say, well, especially when you tell them what it's made from. <laughs> it's made from, you know, parts of the pig that we don't talk about. So um, I'm going to make a very, very simple lentils and pasta and it's one that I make all the time, but I still always think it's special um, because I like it so much. And I just cook up, um, that's, and I, by the way, I buy Pardina lentils, P-A-R-D-I-N-A. Uh, they're a lentil, uh, a small uh, European lentil uh, that is sold by Goya, and they come in those Goya bags in the supermarket. They're not hard to find, at least not hard to find where I live. Um, but any lentil will do. I prefer those, those uh, the, you know, don't use your $7 or $8 a pound de Puy lentils. I think that's a waste. Those you want to eat just for their own sake, I think, like in a salad. But you want one of those small lentils that doesn't fall apart. Um, because American lentils, which are delicious, uh, do become very mushy or even fall apart with long cooking. So they're great for lentil soup, for instance. But in this case, you want to keep the lentils relatively intact. So I take my lentils, uh, let's say two-thirds of a cup of lentils, five cups of water, bring it to a boil, let the lentils cook for about 20 minutes. They will be almost but not quite tender. And then you add your seasonings. Um, I add salt, a, a, a heaping tablespoon of tomato paste, if you have leftover tomato sauce, if you have an open can of tomatoes, you can put a, a crush a couple of tomatoes into there. You need a little tomato product. My preferred one is my gorgeous uh, uh, tomato paste from Syracuse, hand carried for me by various people. And uh, I will credit Paul and Susan LaRosa for bringing me my, my latest batch. 
So, but any you know, uh, a regular tube tomato paste is very good. But even regular tomato paste is very good. A couple tablespoons of regular tomato paste. Um, a clove or two, depending on your taste, of crushed garlic. Crush it with the with, with just with the uh, uh, heel of your hand, and then maybe chop it up a little bit. Throw that in the pot. A couple of uh, well, a small handful of fresh chopped parsley. If you don't have parsley. Uh, fresh parsley. Uh, you can put in a big, big pinch or even a half teaspoon of oregano. Um, uh, and some hot pepper. I like some you know, hot pepper flakes in mine to season it. Uh, let, If you don't like that, then use freshly ground black pepper. And of course, you're going to taste the salt later. So s- stir all that out oh, and a couple of big glugs of extra virgin olive oil. After you put all those things in with your lentils in a lot of water, stir it and let it cook for another five, maybe ten minutes at the most. Depends on what you're going to do next. Now, I this recipe, by the way, I think more or less, or maybe exactly, I don't know, is in my uh, uh, first Italian book, Naples at Table. There's another version in my second Italian book, uh, the Southern Italian Table, and the Southern Italian Table version is a little bit more elaborate. But I, I still go back to my Naples a Table version, uh, which is this one. So you just stir in all those things. And then either you cook pasta in with the lentils, and I'm sure the Naples a Table book probably tells you, to, uh, it doesn't probably, it tells you to use a thin spaghetti broken into small pieces, or some other thin pasta, vermicelli, uh, cut into, you know, broken into pieces, broken spaghetti, by the way, you can, is something you can now buy in a bag in Italy, and I've even seen it here, Goroffalo, I think, is, is marketing a bag of what's called broken spaghetti. So you don't need that much, but do you decide how many people you are and how much you want to eat, anywhere from, let's say, four ounces to six, seven ounces of pasta. But if you want to use another pasta, for instance, um, I love this with mixed pasta shapes. And you can make your own bag of mixed pasta shapes, um, but you can also buy pa- mixed pasta shapes called pasta mista or pasta michata. And I cook that, sev- or you could use penne, or penette, those small penne, I like that in this. Um, any small tubular pasta, I would cook it separate. I would cook it until it's not quite done, still, you know, pretty al dente, and then drain it, save maybe a little bit of pasta water, you may want to use that, um, and put the pasta in with the lentils and let them finish cooking. Not, don't cook them from start to finish. Just let them finish cooking in with the lentils. Now, this can be a soupy mix or this can be a stiff mix. For me, I like the thick mix. I like to eat this actually with a fork, um, but you could eat it with a spoon. If you want it a little brothier, take some of your pasta cooking water and mix that in. And then, of course, before you serve it, you want to taste it for salt and pepper. That's pretty much all you're going to want to eat. You may want to put on top a little bit more herb, either parsley or even a, a pinch of, of, of dried oregano that you rub between your fingers. I find in the south of Italy, even though people cook, they don't, they don't use fresh oregano. Let's just start with that. But dried oregano is not necessarily something you only cook with. For instance, uh, I, I remember a soup um, that I had in, uh, let's see, it was, must have been Calabria. And uh, it was right across from uh, a tomato plant. It's like the largest tomato packing plant in Italy, Basilicata. It wasn't Calabria, it was in Basilicata. And all around this plant, of course, were fields of tomatoes. And we go to this little restaurant across the street from the factory where it looked to me like the executives, not the daily workers, but the executives from the tomato plant uh, had their lunch. And one of the dishes was, uh, this is something you cannot duplicate. They were freshly picked 
beans, but they're a kind of bean that is a dried bean. So even these, these were dried beans, but they were dried maybe only the week before um, that they were cooked, and they were they were cooked um, just just like that in water. Eventually, adding salt, and then they added a lot of cherry tomatoes, which were being grown right there in front of the restaurant, and uh, until those cherry tomatoes popped, and then that was garnished, not cooked with, but garnished with chopped red onion and dried oregano. So everything was fresh, even raw onion was raw, but the oregano was still dried oregano, and, and, and there was a garnish on top, and, of course, a, a seasoning. So I've, I've learned then that that was a good idea. And then after that, I've, I noticed other things. For instance, bruschetta. Uh, sometimes you'll go to somebody's house or uh, to a, a cantina, wine business or something, and they want to give you a little something to go with a glass of wine, and it'll be basically a little crostino, a little cracker, a little slice of dried bread uh, topped with extra virgin olive oil and a pinch of dried oregano. I don't know how I got onto all this. It's not a New Year's <laughs> subject at all, but I'll leave you with my most memorable uh, New Year's Eve. I I was in a deep depression. I was probably I was in my late twenties, and I was in a, what I considered a deep depression. Um, and I didn't go out on New Year's Eve. That was the beginning of my being anti New Year's Eve. But somebody had given me as a gift for Christmas uh, some incredible and a large amount of beluga caviar, and I had also uh, got some chocolate bonbons. I think they were Godiva before Godiva was made in the U.S. It was still being made in in Belgium only, and it was a real delicacy. And I spent New Year's Eve um, in bed, uh, and every time I woke up, which was frequently because I was very restless and not happy, to get myself back to sleep, I had big spoonfuls of beluga caviar um, and for dessert, a Godiva bonbon. (laughs) <laughs> and then I went back to sleep. That's some medicine, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, and then the next day I went to a New Year's party. So there you go. And I have to say, I, I, I recall with great fondness my friend Bill Proops, may he rest, um, had the best New Year's parties. He was a caterer, and he used to introduce his new items to his friends on New Year's Day. I don't know how he got the, the women who worked for him in the kitchen and and serving Somehow they loved him so much they would work on New Year's Day and come to his house. And the big two dishes were uh, chili con carne, which was in the kitchen on the stove, and you helped yourself with all these different garnishes, and uh, southern fried chicken in a day when sort of it wasn't the thing. Um, and, um, and, of course, it's very good at room temperature. And then they would carry around things like miniature this. And he, you know, he had all these hors d'oeuvre things for his catering business. Miniature this and miniature that. Little bites of this and that. And also cakes. What a party. Sounds no yummy. No eggnog. All right. Well, have a happy new year, Arthur. Have a happy, healthy new year, everybody. Happy, um, healthy new year. Happy, healthy. Okay. And uh, then we have... Uh, Chinese New Year to look forward to. Which is earlier. <laughs> this is this is uh this is yeah, it's coming up, isn't it? Very quick. Yep. When, when is it? Do you know? Like the twenty third or something. It's uh, of of, of January. January. It's 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 a little bit later than that. Good. I like that. Yes. All right. Have a great week. Happy New Year. Arthur. Happy New Year, both. Arthur Schwartz, the Food Maven, here on. Robinhood Radio, robinhoodradio.com. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, on the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheese Mongers and Groceries on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef, more information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com.